Hello, I'm Eric Goldring, and welcome to Burlington Matters. Burlington Matters is a relatively new program on TV Kojiko, where we feature topical discussion with interesting guests about the news and events within the city of Burlington. Uh, we had a, a federal election uh, in October of uh, 2015. There was a significant change in the political landscape in the country, and there was certainly a change in the political landscape here in Burlington. Uh, with me today are our two new members of parliament uh, for Burlington, Pam Damoff of Oakville North Burlington and Karina Gold of the Riding of Burlington. So ladies, welcome. Thrilled that you're here. You. Looking forward to the discussion that, uh, uh, that we're going to have in the next half hour and I look forward to working with you um, while we're serving together uh, in different levels of political office. But uh, um, election night, what was that like for you guys? I mean, you worked so hard. Uh, Karina, you'd been knocking on doors for more than a year, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Uh, Pam, you sort of got into it late under different circumstances. Yeah. But what was it like for you on, on election night? Well, election night was thrilling. I mean, as you say, it's a culmination of, for me at least, over a year of hard work and a year of talking to people in the community and really feeling kind of that momentum build and culminating on election night. And uh, some candidates choose to kind of do it on their own and then come in after the results are announced. But I really wanted to be there with my team and my volunteers who I'd been out, you know, on the streets with, at the doors with, um, which is exciting, but there's a lot of pressure as well. And I remember very clearly that uh, the first poll results came in. I think the first poll had been counted. And we're at Emma's back porch, downtown Burlington. And the room erupted in cheers. And it was just, you know, people were thrilled. And, and I turned and was say, well, what happened? I said, Karina, you're winning by two votes. <laughs> 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 Literally two votes. Uh, so that was a, a, a nerve wracking night. But uh, fortunately for me, at least the, the margin kept widening and, and it was really thrilling. And I think for the volunteers, for so many people who put so much time and effort in, and for me as well, it was, it was really exciting. And it was uh, really humbling to have that result. And it was just a great night all around. So Pam, for you, you represent a new riding. You're the first MP for the new riding of Oakville, North Burlington. First of all, briefly, what was it like election night for you and, and describe the boundaries of your new riding? Uh, election night was, I did similar to, to Karina. They didn't want me in the room when, when the results were coming in and, and I insisted on being there and I said to somebody it was like coming home at Christmas. You know when the family is all together and I wanted to be there with the key volunteers and it was really exciting and I did my victory party at the Tin Cup so the Blue Jays were playing that night so we had the Jays winning and the Liberals winning and we won in Oakville, North Burlington so it was just a real atmosphere at the at the party. It was a lot of fun. So my new riding... I just want to say prior to this election uh, Burlington was represented by two ridings. Now we're actually represented by three MPs mm -hmm. because they divided up the ridings. So Pam, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. So so my riding in Burlington is uh, uh, north of Upper Middle Road uh, right. as far as Guelph Line and then it cuts down to the QEW between Walker's Line and Burl Oak. So I'm the northern part of Burlington, so Alton Village, Millcroft, Head and Forest, those are or the Orchard are all areas that are in uh, my riding in Burlington. I also encompass the northern part of uh, of Oakville as well. And, and uh, Lisa Rate actually as the MP for Milton mm -hmm. represents yeah. part yep. of Burlington as well, the area north of the area that you represent. Right. Yeah. North right. of yeah. Highway 5. North of Highway 5 or north of actually the Highway 5 Dundas corridor. Yeah. Well I take up, yeah. Or, or, sorry, Highway 5, the Hi, Dun, sorry, Dundas 407 yeah. corridor, yeah. yes thank yeah. you. Yeah. So we're fortunate we have three actually yeah. representatives yeah. Um, representing yeah. parts of Burlington. Um, Karina, you were knocking on the doors all summer. You got to ch a chance to meet a lot of people. For those people who don't know about you, why don't you just give us a little bit uh, about your background? Sure, happy to do so. Uh, so we met thousands of people <laughs> over the course of the year, but for those of you that don't know me, uh, I grew up in Burlington. I actually went to school with Mayor Goldring's daughter from grade one to grade 12. We went to Clarksdale, Rolling Meadows, and M.M. Uh, Robinson High School. Uh, after graduation, I moved down to Mexico where I learned Spanish. You're just making me feel very old. <laughs> <you know. laughs> Anyway, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of my job description. Isn't okay, it? Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate um, that. <laughs> but, um, 
I moved down to Mexico where I learned Spanish and I volunteered in an orphanage uh, and then I went to McGill in Montreal where I studied political science and Latin American studies. I started my career working in Washington DC at the Organization of American States which is um, similar to the United Nations but just for the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I then did a master's degree at the University of Oxford um, in England and came back to Canada where I worked for the Mexican government in uh, their trade office in Toronto before entering politics. So obviously that background has contributed to your appointment yep. as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Development. Um, so congratulations on Thank that. You. And, and what are the specific duties of a Parliamentary Secretary, particularly for the portfolio that you're involved in? Yes, yeah, so I am extremely privileged and very humbled to have been named uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Development et la Francophonie. Um, so my job basically is to support and assist the Minister carry out her mandate date, um, which uh, really is to uh, focus Canada's development aid on assisting uh, the most poor and the most vulnerable um, and making sure that we are contributing to our image as good global citizens. So that means representing her at events. For example, uh, I'm going to be uh, giving the keynote address on her behalf at the Engineers Without Borders conference later today at McMaster University. Uh, it also means uh, if she's not in the house during question period to answer on her behalf and uh, to assist with managing the portfolio in the capacity that uh, that we arrange. So. Great, yeah. and, and, and Pam, you were a counselor in Oakville for one term and a bit, uh, <laughs> and uh, you're, certainly people in Oakville are familiar with you. Uh, why don't you give us uh, some background for people in Burlington that may not know about you? Well, you know, I was surprised actually how many people in Burlington did know me um, because there's a lot of people who work in Oakville mm -hmm. <laughs> who live in Burlington, quite honestly. But I, I, my business background has been on Bay Street working in commercial real estate and real estate investment banking. And then in 2010, I ran for council. So I was on Oakville Council as a town councillor. Our structure is different than right. yours here in Burlington um, until 2015 when when the federal election took place. And so I, uh, on council, I certainly advocated for uh, cycling and I, I know the needs of, um, you know, having active and healthy living and I know that's an important thing here in Burlington as well. And it's one of those things that we need to encourage our residents to be active and living healthy lifestyles because it's, it's, it's good for all of us, so. So recognizing that you spent a lot of time uh, engaging the mm -hmm. community as you were knocking on doors during the election campaign, uh, what did you hear at the door? Well, I heard, oh, I mean, many issues, but I'd say some of the top ones that I heard in Burlington were the need for more affordable housing uh, at both ends, right? This is something that we've, we've all talked about and we've all heard, uh, but the need for more affordable seniors housing, but also more diversity in the housing stock so that young families can get into the market and that young people from Burlington can stay in this community. Uh, the environment and climate change was a big issue that I heard over and over again. Uh, and the other one that I would say is with regards to seniors and health care. Um, obviously we have a, a large seniors population who deal with the health care system on quite a frequent basis and talking about the need for um, making sure that it's it's holistic and it's serving the needs of, of that community, but also talking about uh, moving towards a better drug strategy and mental health awareness. It's inter interesting. Yeah. The demographics of the two ridings are, are, are different. Mm -hmm. um, the riding in Burlington that you represent, yeah. Karina, is an older riding demographically, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the uh, the new riding, Oakville North Burlington, yeah. uh, the average age, I believe, or median age is about eight years less yeah. than, right. the, than the riding yeah. in Burlington. Did you hear similar things, Pam, or were there different nuances and, and, and uh, emphasis? I did, I did hear different things, actually. I mean, certainly those those issues did come up, mm -hmm. but uh, and the, the common one would be the environment. Without a doubt, that's that's uh, something that's on the mind of people in, in my riding. Um, also, infrastructure, because I would bring it up. And once I sort of explained to people the importance of it, because it's one of those words that the average resident really doesn't understand, but when I would bring up th the flood, right. for example, yeah. and how infrastructure funding would go towards flood mitigation, um, and also public transit, because my my riding definitely has a lot of commuters. I didn't have a lot of people home during the day, um, or they're working during the day. So uh, public transit certainly was one that came up, and, and the economy, quite honestly, you know, the importance of having people working and and uh, growing growing our economy and so economy and jobs were another one that came up quite a bit at the door. 
It's interesting. Now in, in the, uh, the writings that you represent and the provincial writings, uh, Burlington is represented at Queen's Park uh, by two women yeah. and mm -hmm. in Ottawa by three women. What do you make of that? Well, I think it means that uh, that this is a, a, a community and a society where there aren't those barriers or those limits. I don't think um, people judge you based on your demographic characteristics so much as what you bring to the table. Um, and I, I think that's great. I think that's really refreshing. Yeah. I, I think mm -hmm. Burling, Burlington chose the people that are best for the job. In my riding, it was three women that were That's running. That's true. Yeah. Right? All three major parties were represented by female candidates, which I think was probably unique. Um, I didn't check, but I suspect it was pretty unique across the country that, that it was three women running for the major parties in, in, uh, in my riding. So certainly it's been interesting, the change in, in the, the mood in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. We have a very different style from the previous Prime Minister uh, to Prime Minister Trudeau. And I just find it interesting I'm saying Prime Minister Trudeau for the second time in my life. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, what do you think are the qualities that he embodies that uh, uh, were as attractive to the Canadian people? I think energy was important. Mm -hmm. um, one thing to to think about is that we are we are going through a bit of a difficult time economically right now. There's a bit of malaise both economically but also when we think about our future and the challenges that are upon us and what I found at the door that people responded to and were looking for was someone who who had a vision for the future right and said you know what times are tough but we're gonna figure it out we're gonna work hard and we're gonna move forward and we're gonna be successful at it and that's the message people wanted to hear and they wanted to know we had a plan to go with it and so when I was talking to people, they were really looking for someone who understood the challenges that we have and know that we can work through it. And so I think it was the energy, the optimism, and the, the sense of hope that, that he embodied and I think that he uh, transmitted to his candidates and, and to people across the country. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say, and also uh, I think the fact that um, just offering people the, the positive yeah. and the genuine interest in people, mm -hmm. um, that there was a genuine will, you know, a genuine desire to connect with people and that's, that's something that you, you know, you can't fake that. Mm -hmm. And I think that came across to people that, uh, and the longer term vision definitely was something that I heard quite a bit. Yeah. I know it's novel to see a Prime Minister doing selfies with uh, <laughs> people on the street. That, that's, yeah. that's, that's very different than what we've been used to. Four years, uh, you have four years, which some people think is a long time. Uh, I know after having served <laughs> yeah. one term as mayor and working on a second term, it, it's not all that long once you get organized yeah. uh, and then you get another election campaign to deal with. You really yeah. have a window of maybe two and a half years to really get a lot of uh, stuff done. Um, what are the priorities? Well, you know, I'm really proud of how quickly we have moved mm -hmm. on some things. So like the long form census. Um, immediately reinstating that and getting getting that moving really quickly because as you know in a municipality that's something we rely on I can remember asking questions of planning staff and they would say I'm sorry we can't answer that because we don't have the yeah. long-form census I'm anymore. thrilled the long-form census yeah. has come back. it's it's something that's really important to inform decisions and and so we moved really quickly on that and on the Syrian refugees and and a lot of the things that we're going to do are, are as you know as, as a mayor you require the political will to do it and and I'm really proud of how quickly we have taken some of these steps and done them in a in a a really thoughtful way so mm -hmm. so we've done them quickly but we haven't done them without following uh, process and, and being thoughtful about doing it and the response I've had from from residents has been overwhelmingly supportive of of the things we've done so far and you're right four years seems like a long time but it's not so we're certainly trying to move quickly but also in a way mm -hmm. that that doesn't rush decisions through Okay, if you've just tuned in, you're watching Burlington Matters. I'm Mayor Rick Goldring. We're with Pam Damoff and Karina Gould, the new MPs for the uh, City of Burlington. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back on Burlington Matters. Welcome back to Burlington Matters. I'm Mayor Rick Goldring. With me today is Pam Damoff and Karina Gould, the two new members of Parliament for the City of Burlington, representing us in Ottawa. So we are talking about the environment before, and uh, certainly there was the Paris Climate Change Conference shortly after uh, you were elected, and a big Canadian contingent went over there. Um, we've had sort of mixed reviews of how Canada has handled the climate change file. Uh, we've made some great uh, commitment, um, but we haven't figured out how we're going to fulfill those commitments. 
How do we, what do we have to do this time to get it right? What, what, what progress do we have to make on climate change um, this time? Well, you know, I think one of the biggest differences you're going to see from the federal government this time is working in partnership with the provinces and municipalities because it is a huge issue. Um, we can't do it alone, so you as a city council can't do it in Burlington mm -hmm. without support. And we as a federal government can't do it from support. So actually working together is, is something, and we're going to be making investments in green infrastructure, clean technology, public transit, all things that will go towards the environment and, and you know, reaching those goals. But also working with business and, and, you know, you're seeing in Alberta where the Premier of Alberta is working with, with business in order to advance a, an environmental agenda. And that's, that's the kind of attitude that we need. And, and so I think that'll probably be the biggest um, plus for us is if we're all working towards a common goal. And I think you're starting to see that more. Well, I think there's economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. you know, if we address yeah. climate change, there's tremendous Absolutely. opportunity uh, uh, for the economy. And I think a clean technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of clean tech uh, companies in Burlington that certainly can uh, benefit by a, a greener yeah. uh, agenda. Is there anything you, like, we're, we're speaking in, in broad terms as far as the potential yeah. uh, programs, do we see uh, potential investment programs yeah. for clean technology? Yeah, so I mean one of the promises that we made on the campaign trail was an investment in clean technologies and uh, and 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 developing clean technologies here in Burl and in, well, in Burlington, but also in Canada writ large. Uh, we think there's tremendous opportunity for Canada to be a leader on this front uh, and to use and foster some of the existing technology and, and existing knowledge that we have here. So we're definitely going to see that, and uh, the Prime Minister has been very clear about making that one of his priorities. Pam, you talked about, thank you, uh, you talked about transit, mm -hmm. and uh, we're the only G8 or G7 country in the world without a national transit strategy mm -hmm. or, or policy or approach. Yeah. Um, what can the federal government do in this area besides just giving us money, which we appreciate, <laughs> but is there anything else that uh, the federal government can do with regard to um, a national transportation or transit strategy? Well, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. We do need some kind of national strategy and we need the political will from, from the federal government and all levels of government to make this happen. And it's, it's critically important. I mean, that's probably the number one issue that we hear in this area is transportation. So whether it's moving people or goods to, mm -hmm. to market, we need to deal with transportation and public transit is such a key component of that. So we are making making financial investments, but there does need to be a, a, a strategy about how this is done and, and quite frankly political will from all levels of government mm -hmm. to move it forward. And, and, uh, go ahead, oh, I'm just going to add to that. I mean, one thing that we've heard, particularly the past couple of days, from both the city but also business and community groups, is the need to include healthy, active transportation mm -hmm. options within yeah. that strategy as well, uh, to make sure that it is more holistic. And we're really thinking about how we move people. I mean, the reality yeah. is that the municipalities have so many responsibilities. As the former mm -hmm. mayor of Mississauga, Hazel McCallion, uh, would say, uh, the feds got all the money, the provinces got all the all the power, and the municipalities have all the problems <laughs> and all the <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, but you know, in recognizing that uh, the climate change file is important mm -hmm. uh, to all of us, it's important to the new government yeah. in Ottawa, it's certainly been important to the Liberal government in Ontario for yeah. some time, and it's certainly important to municipalities as well. But the only way that we're going to make meaningful strides, meaningful progress mm -hmm. with regard to reducing greenhouse gas emissions is we need to make sure that there's proper funding for municipalities to uh, uh, put in the right infrastructure to make the, our communities more walkable, yeah. uh, more bikeable, yeah. um, to bring in more transit, uh, to invest in electrical uh, char recharging yeah. uh, infrastructure, uh, so electrical cars or electric cars are more uh, easily adaptable uh, in our environments. Yeah. The only way we're going to do it is working with municipalities. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree yeah. with you more. I mean, having been on a municipal council, I know that's the biggest hurdle that we faced was getting the funding to do that. And quite frankly, you know, we can talk about the federal government doing things with the environment, but we need to change behaviors. And the only way we can do that, getting people walking, cycling, and taking transit, is if we do have the infrastructure to make it possible for them to do it. You know, it's interesting with regard to, to the environment. I mean, most people use the green cart, they use the blue box, yeah. and it's habitual. Yeah. Right, and, and we're a slave to our habits, good or bad. But with regard to reducing carbon, reducing the consumption yeah. of fossil fuels, there's no clean, simple way 
to do that. Yeah. And, and clearly we need to work on a whole suite of, of opportunities to implement yeah. that will allow that to happen. But do you know why people are doing that though is because the, the, re, the municipality made it easy for people to use the blue, blue box and green yeah. card. True. And so it did become a habit because it was easy for them to use. So if, if you had a dedicated bike lane that went to a GO train station from the north for example and it was plowed in the winter and, and people knew that they could get there quickly and safely you would see people using it but without those infrastructure which, which quite frankly you as a municipality just don't have the funds to be able to construct. Yeah. So speaking of that, I mean one of the, one of the challenges the municipalities do have is yeah. the fact that uh, we have something like 65 percent of the infrastructure in, in Canada mm -hmm. and uh, we receive about ten and a half percent of the the tax yeah. revenue mm -hmm. uh, that's generated. Uh, we do get some regular revenue uh, from the federal government with regard to part of the gas tax. Mm -hmm. We receive that from the provincial government as well and the region gets uh, other funds f yeah. with regard to health and social services uh, from the province. Um, but one of the things that the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is after and the Association of Municipalities of Ontario is after is more sustainable funding, more revenue tools for municipalities. Yeah. Do you see, I know it's early days yeah. and, and we haven't got our head around all um, that, that whole issue yet from a federal government point of view, but do you see the opportunity for something to happen in that regard? Yeah. And I'll, I'll let Pam jump in on this in a bit more because she has more experience as a municipal councillor. However, uh, I think that's a message we've heard loud and clear. And there are a lot of municipal politicians now serving at the federal level who understand that municipalities, as you say, have a large chunk of the infrastructure, but they don't have the, econ or the financial tools to necessarily fulfill the needs of that deficit. And I think that's something that our government is taking very seriously into consideration. And, and we, we made those commitments during the election that we need to provide more sustainable, more uh, determined, more you know, accessible funding for municipalities to maintain the infrastructure and hopefully to create some transformative infrastructure to change those behaviors and to make it more convenient for people to participate in those activities that in the end are, are going to be better for our future. Well, the good news is we're having the dialogue, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you can only start somewhere, and we're starting with the dialogue. We're starting talking about yeah. the issues, and I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to figure out something at the national level that will yeah. be meaningful mm -hmm. uh, for all municipalities across the country. Affordable housing, I mean, uh, Karina, you mentioned that, yeah. and Pam, mm -hmm. when you're going door to door, you heard a lot about affordable housing um, from helping younger people get their toehold in the real estate market as well as for, for seniors. Uh, in the past, federal governments have had a significant role and providing social housing in our yeah. communities. What do we see happening uh, during your, your tenure in office? So we've committed $20 billion towards social infrastructure as one of our uh, key pillars in our you know, massive historic infrastructure commitment over the next uh, 10 years. And part of social infrastructure includes affordable housing and also housing affordability. So mm -hmm. one of the issues that we faced during this campaign was the renewal of the cooperative agreements. Co-ops are, are great organizations in our community that kind of allow for diversified income levels to live in the same area. and those making sure that we renew those agreements is, is an important measure that the federal government can do, but also making sure that we're providing new housing stock as well that's sub subsidized by the federal government, but also creating tools and mechanisms to uh, ensure that we have a bit more housing affordability and re-mandating the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation to get a little bit more involved in that, in that uh, industry. I know from a yeah. purchase point of view, yeah. um, affordable housing is very challenging. Yeah. Uh, certainly from a rental point of view, if uh, the region owns a bunch, bunch of social housing, the region can, can yeah. subsidize or through different levels of government can provide subsidies for people uh, to get into particular mm -hmm. social housing. <clears throat> However, from a purchase point of view, yeah. you can make it affordable, but it's only affordable once yeah. and then the market takes over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've thought long and hard about this. We need, I figure we need to create some sort of structure that would allow people that move into a home uh, to be able to receive inflation type increases mm -hmm. in their equity, but when they, when they sell, yeah. they, they, they get the increase 
in their equity, but the increase is capped and somebody else can come, come in right. and take their place. I have no idea if that's possible, but I, I, but I really a, do believe yeah. we need to be creative in yeah. some areas to make it easier for people who want to buy something and not just want to rent something. Well, but even, <clears throat> and, and that's an interesting idea, and we can certainly bring that forward and see, and I think there are a lot of minds that are working on this issue because particularly in uh, you know metropolitan areas, it's a, it's a big challenge yeah. um, to find something that's affordable. But the other thing is, is we don't have a lot of rental stock in Canada. So one of the things that we talked about during the campaign was incentivizing developers to build more rental housing options mm -hmm. uh, so that people can rent as well. And it is, you know, when you have uh, younger people or people at the end of their careers, you know, who want to downsize, you want to provide those options for people as well at an affordable rate. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting in Canada, I mean, the yeah. preferred option is, is to own. Yeah. Uh, but in Europe, that is not necessarily the mm -hmm. case. I mean, there's so many different yeah. housing forms in Europe and housing structures. Mm -hmm. and I think when I was in Sweden and the majority of people rent yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in, in Sweden. So um, we've got to look at different things. And I think what <coughs> we ultimately want is to have a diversity of options, right? right? Yeah. That fit the needs and the desires of yeah. people and, and to make sure that those options are available. There's many issues on the plate. There, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I could have a long list of municipal yeah. issues. We'll that, have another that, one that, of these. Yeah. We'll have another one of these. But there's 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 talk about reform of Canada pension. The mm -hmm. the um, the provincial government's going down the road to establish an Ontario retirement uh, pension plan. Um, and then there's talk of well, maybe they're not going to have to do that if there's CPP reform. Uh, so that's one issue that's that's, mm -hmm. that's percolating. Another issue that's percolating that's interesting is democratic reform. Uh, we've had the first pass the post system in Canada since 1867, and the prime minister has been very bold about this, yeah, yeah. saying that that the past election in 2015 is the last last election based on first past the post. Yeah, yeah. How do you see the, the potential for change evolving? Well, I think, you know, we need to engage people in the political process, and we're losing people because of the, they feel their vote doesn't matter. And so, you're right, he was very bold during the election campaign, and so the electoral reform includes changing first past the post, but also some mm -hmm. other things, looking at electronic voting, and... and so we're going to have to have you come back and talk about okay. this again, All right. we're, we're ready to wrap up. So, oh, okay. 30 <laughs> minutes goes really quick, we're having a great discussion. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Karina Gould and Pam Damoff, our new MPs for Burlington, and for joining me today on Burlington Matters. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, if you have an idea for a future episode uh, for Burlington Matters, uh, please contact the mayor's office at mayor at burlington.ca or 905-335-7607. I thank you for tuning in to Burlington Matters uh, here on Kojiko, truly local television. We will see you next time on Burlington Matters.